which is a joint project uh, between Neath, Patalbot and Rotherham and Taft County Councils, Natural Resources Wales and NPT and RCT Local Nature Partnerships and it's a project which is funded by NRW. Uh, questions can be added to the chat if you think of anything as you go along and will be answered at the end. Any questions that we don't have time for, uh, we will provide a written answer and circulate that after the fact. Uh, so that is more than enough from me and it gives me great pleasure to hand over to Charles for his talk. Charles. Okay, thanks Joey. Um, hopefully you can all see the screen uh, with the title and my name on it. So there's quite a lot of slides to get through, so I'll move on pretty swiftly now. Um, topics in this presentation where we're going to cover um, the things there, perhaps a little bit more as well, but basically we're going to start off looking at current historic and prehistoric timescales in the plantation landscape. We'll consider and discuss plantation habitats, biodiversity in the forest structure, biodiversity in the non-forest structure, uh, a little bit about recombinant ecology, biodiversity in the future plantation landscape, and then finally restoring the pre-plantation landscape. So here's a, an interesting little quote, which I think is rather apt, perhaps a little bit out of, con out of context uh, with regard to where it came from, but it is strangely sort of relevant to, to what we're talking about today. We are where we are, however we got here, what matters is where we go next. Um, so that's really sort of behind the whole ethos of this talk, if you like. Well, where are we now? The, the map on the left shows the distribution of uh, conifer plantation estates throughout Wales, England and Scotland. Um, there you can see it all signified by the dark areas on the map. And we all know, of course, of the massive areas of uh, forestry plantation, for instance, in Kielder Forest in Northumberland and Dumfries and Galway, two of the largest sort of man-made forests in Europe. Um, but, uh, you know, scattered all over um, Great Britain, we have other forestry uh, systems as well. And the one we are talking about today mostly is this one down here, which uh, we call Coid Morgana, which is the, um, the forestry estate within Glamorgan, basically. Wales has about 106,000 hectares of conifer forest. That's half of the, the woodland that is actually in Wales, made up of, of conifer plantation. And about 20% of this is in Neath Talbot and Ronda and Taff. So down here, these are the actual figures um, for, sorry, these are the actual figures for Neath Talbot and Ronda and Taff in hectares. The total is 20,865. Uh, which is considerably less than the, the, the total area of Kielder Forest, for instance, but it's still a very significant amount of conifer plantation. Most of that's in the uplands and is dominated by Sitka spruce. So if you look at a, a Google Earth aerial map of, of the area, you can pick out Neath Patal, but really fairly easily because it's where quite a lot of conifer plantation is concentrated. And uh, yeah. village Villages like Resolven and Crinant and Glyneath and Glencorug are actually surrounded by conifer plantations. So that's the area. And this is the area mainly that, that I'm talking about uh, in this presentation. Although a lot of things that I will be mentioning and talking about are relevant to, to other conifer plantations as well. So we might ask the question, how did we get here? This is a, a the, the sort of modern conifer plantation landscape of, of South Wales. Uh, if we went back 8,000 years ago, um, then we'd be in a, a, an ecosystem of boreal I think you just put yourself on mute there, Charles, so you just unmute yourself and carry on. Sorry, guys. How did I do that? OK, are we OK? Yeah, yeah all good. Yeah. OK, did, did, did we miss, did it go on mute during that slide or should, should I go forward? Uh, no, carry on from uh, where you were just now. OK, so I, I talked about that. OK, I, I'll repeat what I said about this again. Um, for South Wales, and we have good evidence for this for, from uh, pollen records from Craigie Lynn, which is within Glyncastle Forest, which is in the, the Welsh estate. 
Pine forests were here 8,000 years ago. That's the last time really that conifer forest dominated our landscape. That is native conifer forest dominated our landscape. And then that gradually gave way over thousands of years to deciduous woodland. We entered the Atlantic period, a sort of uh, a milder, wetter period, the climatic optimum, 6,000 years ago. And this is when uh, our landscape would have been dominated by uh, deciduous forest, the, the so-called wildwood that uh, Oliver Rackham often talked about. But when Neolithic people and Neolithic cultures came along and post-Neolithic cultures happened after that, um, lots of that uh, wildwood, particularly in the uplands, was cleared. And so by the time we get to the Middle Ages, and probably for some time before that, most of our uplands, if not all of our uplands, had been converted to moorland. And then, so that goes on um, for another thousand years uh, until we get to the modern era. So if we went back 100 years ago, when forestry in Britain was starting, most of the places where we have forestry in South Wales today were actually moorland. And in fact, forestry didn't take off very quickly in South Wales. There was some planting in the early days in 1919 and thereafter, but it wasn't really until after the Second World War, let's say from 1950s onwards, that conifer plantations really uh, came into a, a, a big effect in the, um, the South Wales landscape. So the pre-plantation landscape of uh, the area that we're considering today would have looked like this, mostly moorland of this sort. And uh, then that was gradually forested with, with, with conifers and, and it gave us the landscape of today, which you can see here. And really the important point I'm trying to get across to you is that afforestation has happened very quickly on or in a landscape that hadn't supported forests for thousands of years. So these are really, on this side here, we've got a time scale which we measure almost in millennia. And on this side, we've got a time scale which we measure in decades. So there's a very, very great difference in the time scales. This is a very rapid transformation of, 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 a, of a landscape. In fact, this is probably the biggest lands, land use change that Britain uh, has seen ever, uh, you know, since people sort of started roaming around on these islands. So let's talk then about plantation habitats. The, the, the big message here is that conifer plantations are not just conifer forests. The plantation is made up of forest and non-forest systems. Now I prefer to use this term rather than open habitats. I'll explain a little bit about that a bit later on. The term open habitats, in my opinion, is a little bit vague and we need to specify it a little bit more accurately. Anyway, so where are we now? This is what the forest landscape looks like in, in Riola Forest, which is near to Glencastle Forest, which I, I mentioned to you uh, a few minutes ago. The plantation landscape is complex. It's made up of forest systems and non-forest systems. Okay, the forest systems are easy to identify. That's where the trees are being grown. But the roads that run through the forest system are not forest. They are part of the non-forest system. And there are other habitats as well which are part of the non-forest system, which I'll get round to in a moment. When all of this started, i.e. back in 1919 and then after the Second World War, there was no biodiversity plan or model. And nobody could have predicted where we are now back then. We got here by default. And what we've got is a very dynamic mosaic of habitats and ecosystems. So this picture shows it, I think, really well. We've got forest systems within the plantation, which are easy to identify. This is a, a coop of Sitka spruce here, surrounded by Japanese larch, which isn't there anymore. <clears throat> and we've got non-forest um, systems here. This is all within Glencastle um, plantation. And this is a, a north-facing heather-clad bank with some sandstone outcrops here, all of which support some really interesting plant communities, non-forest plant communities. And this is Astrid Vernal Forest, which is in Ronda Canatath. <clears throat> and clearly here we've got forest. And we've got a roadside bank, which isn't forest. 
and we've got a roadside verge, which is in the forest. So we've got a forest system and we've got a, a non-forest system. The forest environment is dominated obviously by conifers. There are some broad leaves as well, particularly things like beech. And it's divided into compartments called coops, and this is where the main timber crops are grown. It's mostly Sitka spruce in South Wales and elsewhere in other parts of Britain as well. This is all Sitka spruce. And previously, before the, the Remorium disease um, disaster, we had lots of Japanese larch as well. Uh, we have pines, of course, Scots pine and lodgepole pine, like many other forest systems have. And many other species are grown here too, in lesser amounts, Norway spruce, Douglas fir, Western hemlock, Western red cedar, Lawson cypress, you know, there's, there's quite a lot of others which are minor crops in a way. So with the exception of Scots pine, and there, there are reservations with respect to Scots pine as well, all these conifers are exotic, they're non-indigenous. Many of them, of course, were derived from uh, specimens or seed that was taken from the Pacific Northwest in North America. So here are the main culprits then, here's Sitka spruce, you know, some Japanese large, or it could be the Japanese large hybrid. I don't distinguish between the two in this talk. And this is lodgepole pine. Uh, this is Scots pine. And what I, I like, I like showing this photograph just to show the way in which plantation Scots pines, tall, single stemmed with rather pointy sort of uh, canopies. Um, this is probably um, the, the derivation of this, or the provenance of this, is probably Central Northern European, um, so it's probably subspecies Sylvestris. This, on the other hand, is a photograph of native Caledonian pine forest. Notice the sort of very rounded canopies that Caledonian pines have. Uh, this is Pinus Sylvestris subspecies Scotica, so this is our native Scots pine. And just for continuity, uh, this is what the inside of a native pine forest in, in in, in the Caledonian forest, looks like there's, there's going to be birch and juniper and cowberry and all sorts of other nice things in there as well. The, the diversity of the Caledonian pine forest, of course, is much greater than the diversity of, of our plantation pine forest. And again, just for continuity, this is what a, a native Sitka spruce forest looks like in Alaska. Sitka is, is a place in Alaska. Uh, it's a Russian word which is derived from when Alaska belonged to Russia before America bought Alaska from Russia. And uh, Sitka spruce is Alaska's state tree. And it's an interesting photograph. Um, I photographed this many decades ago, but it shows Sitka spruce growing in almost pure monoculture stands. Um, and it's relatively even age as well. You can see there are young trees too. But also you can see the way in which Sitka actually clings to the rocks here. And in southern Alaska, in fact, citrus spruce forms the, the timber line. Um, so that, that's, that's really interesting too. So that's what a native Sitka spruce forest looks like in Alaska. And Sitka spruce can, can be pretty big. It's a very fast growing tree. So this is one of Robert Van Pelt's photographs of uh, the Queets spruce. This is one of the tallest uh, Sitkas that grows in Olympic National Park. That's 248 feet tall. And when many people see it, they think, oh God, it must be thousands of years old. But in fact, it's not. It's probably only about 700 years old. Sitka is incredible uh, at putting on volume. It's, it's an amazing tree, Grow, grows so well. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the forest habitats. I'm gonna divide the forest, the plantation ecosystem into two sectors. The forest habitats, which are the A habitats, and the non-forest habitats, which are called the B habitats. And then we've got A1, which is clear fell and pre-thicket. We've got A2, which is thicket, and A3, which is mature. See how all this fits in. So here's the forest cycle then. We start with clear fell, and the trees are planted there, of course. And that gives rise to thicket. Uh, and it's easy to define thicket. It's if you can't walk through the Sitkas, <laughs> you're in thicket. Um, and then that gives rise to mature forests, and I use mature only in the silvicultural sense of the word, not mature in the sense of what natural Sitka forests look like. Um, so that's a mature uh, Sitka coop, and again easy to, to identify because you can actually see through it. The, the, the trunks are tall and straight and the canopy is lifted off the ground, and there's quite a lot of light getting in 
uh, to, the, to the coupe as well. And then that's clear fell, then you go back to the clear fell, right? So that's the forest cycle. And each phase in the cycle has a, a distinctive flora and a distinctive fauna. And this is really interesting, perhaps one of the most interesting things of all, for me anyway, of the whole sort of forest ecosystem. There is a mosaic of successional phases in the plantation landscape. So we can have a little equation here. F stands for the forest, C is clear fell and pre-thicket, T is thicket, and M is in the tuber phase. And at any one time, the forest is going to be made up of clear fell components, thicket components, and mature components. Although the actual amounts of each of these can vary with time. Okay, you may have a lot of clear fell. At the moment, we've got huge amounts of clear fell in, 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 in East Batal and Rhonda Kalinta, simply because we are, you know, we, we're chopping down all the larch. Uh, and quite a lot of Sitka's coming down as well. So lots of changes taking place. We've got a lot of clear fell. Um, but at the end of the day, when you add all this up, it equals F, which is the forest. Okay, so let's look at some bird communities because uh, they offer a really good example of what I'm talking about with respect to the mosaic successional phases. So here's the forest cycle again, clear fell and pre thicket, thicket, mature, and then back to clear fell and pre thicket. In the clear fell and pre thicket phases, we have a distinct community of birds which in, in our area includes nightjar, willow warbler, white throat, tree pipit, meadow pipit. Stone chart, wren, cuckoo. I could mention others as well. Outside of our area, um, we also have um, hen harrier uh, in Ireland and I, I believe in Kielder as well. So hopefully one day we'll have hen harrier down here breeding too. And then when we get to the thicket stage, we get a slightly different bird community developing chiff chart, moving black cap, garden warbler, um, song thrush, blackbird, dunnock, and robin. Garden warbler is a pretty good indicator species for thicket, um, I find anyway. And then finally, when we reach the mature stage, we have some really iconic species like goshawk, honey buzzard, red kite, um, and so on. Wood warbler are now beginning to use sitkas in our area, uh, and siskin, lesser red pole, and crossbill, of course, and the very commonly coated and gold crest. And again, we do have long eared owl, uh, but we don't have any firm evidence that they're breeding yet in our mature systems, but I, I'm fairly sure if they're not doing it already, they will. So, so roughly, when you go from clean spell to mature, you see an increasing abundance of, of birds, not necessarily an increasing, um, increasing species number, although that tends to happen sometimes as well. I'm saying that simply because some clear fell systems can be very uh, diverse in bird species. Anyway, you get the picture. And here's some little photographs to rest your eyes upon. Here's a lovely photograph by Mike Turing of a nightjar family uh, in Penacamoy, which is in our, our area. So you can see there's a, a mature bird with her two chicks sitting very cosily there. Uh, these three birds really are iconic members of, of the mature plantation system. Uh, this is lesser redfall, siskin and crossbow, common crossbow. And uh, finally, many thanks to Steve Roberts for allowing me to show his wonderful photographs of, of honey buzzard. These, these birds here were photographed in our state, uh, our forest, conifer forest estate. Um, here's a, a mature bird here, and here's a chick who's clearly uh, defending a little territory there. So these are all birds which are, are, are in our uh, forest systems. I mean, forgive me for this. I know it looks a bit complicated, perhaps it's over complicated, but it's the only way I can think of getting across this message uh, diagrammatically. Um, we can think about, you know, where we are at any one time in the forest system as a configuration. So T1 start, stands for a particular time, and we've got sort of rectangular symbols here, we've got circular and oval symbols, and we've got triangular symbols. The rectangular symbols stand for mature forests, the yellow circular ones and oval ones stand for clear fell and pre-thicket, and the red triangles stand for uh, thicket. So over a period of years, let's say 20 years, okay, of course the position of these coops doesn't change, they're still in the same place, but now what they are 
in terms of the forest system has changed. So a mature forest may have been clear fell, so that becomes clear fell, and a clear fell would make, become, might become a thicket. Uh, the thickets may stay the same. Uh, this clear fell component here has changed uh, to, uh, sorry, this mature phase here has changed to a clear fell, and this clear fell here has changed to a thicket and so on. So the configuration after, let's say, 20 years is completely different. So we've got a, two, a T2 configuration space and we've got a T1 configuration space, and they're ultimately dependent on time. So there's a temporal aspect here and there's a spatial aspect here. So I think that is really an interesting thing to think about. And so you can say that successional diversity is distributed in space and time. Now, that sounds as if I'm going to launch into a discussion of Minkowski space, but I'm not going to do that. We've got a, a very simple formula here, as I've shown you before, F equals C plus T plus M. Uh, C is clear fell and pre-thicket, T is thicket, M is mature phase. This photograph was taken maybe about 15 years ago, I can't remember now. Um, this pre-thicket here is now thicket. Um, this sort of late thicket phase here now is looking quite, quite mature. And so you can see that, you know, the spatial aspect is there, but also the temporal aspect is there as well. And that mosaic in time and space is fascinating for me anyway, and may play a part in our future uh, designs for, for forest ecosystems. These um, clear fell systems are, are really interesting. This is a, a place called Foyle Vanadai, which is within the Woodland Estate. Um, it's, a, it's a hill, it's, it's quite near to where I'm sitting right now. Um, and one side of this hill has got um, ancient Cecil Oak woodland. But most of the hill, hill in 2014, when this photograph was taken, was clad with pine. A lot of it is lodgepole pine, which you've got here, but also there's quite a lot of um, Macedonian pine and Scots pine as well. OK, well, in 2019, all of the, the um, lodgepole pine was taken out, which give rise to a, a clear fell like this. So this photograph was taken in 2020, April 2020, several months after the clear fell. About two weeks after this photograph was taken, there were nightjar and tree pipit already setting up territories in this area. You know, how quickly these birds actually uh, sort these things out. And also adder were being picked up here. So the adder, pretty important component of, of many of our clear fell systems. And then Hi. this winter, we, we, we had a, a, a winter visitor, a, a snow bunting actually came along, so I thought I, I, I introduced that. So it's not just summer birds that are influenced by the, the changes that occur in conifer plantations, but also our winter visitors as well. If you gaze at this photograph, you can see why Sitka spruce doesn't get great press. Um, Sitka spruce cannot often have a, a very, very poor ground flora. We all know that. And this often gave rise to the sort of a, idea and the notion that conifer forests were biological deserts, which of course they're not. Um, but it can look like this. A mature Sitka spruce forest can actually fill up on, on the ground floor with lots of very shade tolerant species, particularly ferns. And then we've got Dryopteris affinis here, which is uh, the scaly male fern. We've got Dryopteris dilatata there, which is the broad buckler fern. And also here we've got ivy and there's also um, wood sorrel and hard fern and various other things here. Mostly uh, shade tolerant species, um, but it's, it's quite an interesting looking flora. Of course, it's nowhere near this. This is an old growth forest with Sitka spruce in the Olympic Peninsula in Washington State. And you can see these massive Sitkas here, which are probably less than 100 years old, maybe a bit more, it's difficult to tell. Uh, and of course, this is not a pure Sitka forest, this is Sitka growing with Western hemlock. But this is what a real mature Sitka forest looks like. So we can never hope to replicate this if we only let our Sitka forest grow for 60 years, okay? And I'm not advocating we should let them grow any longer than that, but I'm just saying we, we can never get to this um, with our current system. But you know, even though we can't have that, we do have this. And this, I think, is really very, very interesting. This is a mature Sitka spruce forest 
within our estate, it's, it's Bulk Forest in Neathwood Talbot. And the ground floor of this forest is absolutely saturated with bryophytes. And even the drainage trenches here are now being blocked up with bryophytes, which of course is making them even wetter. And so they're supporting even more bryophytes. So there's, there's a luxuriance here, which isn't replicated in any other woodland type that we have in South Wales. Um, and here's another example of a similar uh, bryophyte saturated flora in Glencorog in Neathport Talbot. And here's a gang of us here actually doing some quadrating in, in uh, a Sitka spruce coop in Rigos and Ronda Canantaf. Uh, this Sitka spruce coop is about to be clear felled. In fact, it may have been clear felled already. So we wanted baseline data uh, to see what how it's going to develop after clear felling. But anyway, it's commonly we commonly find that we we get about you know 29 species per site that's that's the mean that we get but often it's more than that it can be up to about 40 species per site and here are some of the species that that, that we get um, quite commonly calura calyptrifolia i'll talk about in a moment but these are things like dicranum majus uh hokeria lucens hypnum jetlandicum and cobrium juniperoidium uh, Plagiothesium undulatum in particular, um, uh, Rhytodiadarpa floreus. These are mosses and liverworts. These are mosses mostly that um, you find in ancient sessile oak woodlands, particularly those which are, are Atlantic, <laughs> Atlantic in their, their characteristics. And a, a bryologist may look at that and might say, well, there's nothing special about that because you would find all of these species in a, a, a Cessar oak woodland, but, but that's the point, you see. This isn't a Cessar oak woodland, it's a Sitka spruce forest. And these are Cessar oak woodland bryophytes, which are now saturating the ground, ground flora of a Sitka spruce forest. And in fact, they're saturating the ground flora of a Sitka spruce forest, which has been planted on land which didn't, hadn't supported any forest for thousands of years before that. And so this has happened in a remarkably short period of time. And I think this is really, really interesting. Lots of fungi too. Um, I, I'm sticking to Sitka basically here, but um, lots of fungi in Sitka spruce forest. At the moment, we're up to 130 plus species of macrofungi um, for our local Sitka spruce forest. And <clears throat> that's Put them on a par with sort of what, what you find in Sitka spruce forests in, in Ireland. Um, not as good as the sort of species list you find for Sitka spruce forests in Scotland, but that's understandable given that uh, they are, there's a, a native conifer forest element in Scotland anyway, which can supply sort of uh, input, if you like, to those systems. <coughs> Excuse me. So this is Scots pine. Scots pine. It's completely different, Sitka. The, the ground, ground floor of Scots pine is usually dominated by ericaceous uh, things like bilberry and, and common heather and so on and so forth. And this is a, a fairly typical picture of what a, a maturing or mature Scots pine coop would look like. Again, compare this with a Caledonian pine forest uh, uh, picture. This, is, this was taken by Aben, Abernethy where, where I was a few years ago. Um, which is dominated by heather, bilberry, cowberry, juniper, and that beautiful ostrich plume feather moss. Um, so there's much greater diversity there. However, let me go back to the other slide. There is a certain resemblance in the physiognomy, if you like, of the ground flora, an ericaceous ground flora there, and an ericaceous ground flora here as well. Japanese larch is, is completely different, of course, from all of the others because larch is deciduous. And so larch is almost a surrogate oak woodland in, in, in a sense in, in, in our area. And it'll support a ground flora with bluebells, as you can see here. And wood warblers love larch plantation. Um, for them, it's, it's, it's just like Cessar oak woodland. Unfortunately, of course, we've lost most of our larch now. Uh, and so the, they are, wood warbler are having to adapt to other parts of the, the kind of plantation. <coughs> Larch is also really good for lichens. I'll just show you some beard lichens that, that, that we find in abundance on, on larches, particularly when they're in exposed places. 
probably the most um, spectacular one is the uh, is the, the string of soft salt, which is Chesnia articulata, which you can see here. Uh, and then this, which is very, very pollution sensitive, by the way. And this is also another pollution sensitive uh, as near, which is as near Florida. We also get as near Cornuta, as near Philopendula, and most commonly of all, as near sub Floridana. You can see some of the other mosses grown here too. There's Parmelias here, and Platysmatia glauca there, and Ivernia prunastri. And so it's, it's a fabulous diversity of, of lichen sometimes on some of these larches. This is also really uh, interesting. It's the amount of common wintergreen now, which is um, coming up in our forests. And we find it under Sitka spruce, and particularly under lodgepole pine, and where there was larch in the past. There still are some um, coops of larch around which do have common wintergreen, but there's an awful lot of common wintergreen now in our plantations. All right, so that's the, the forest system. Now let's look at the, the non-forest environment. And the big surprise perhaps is that most of the biodiversity of the forest occurs here, even though the non-forest environment is by far the smallest component of the plantation. And you, you'll see why in a minute. Now we've developed a, a classification system. I don't like the term open habitats for forestry systems because really it, that's too general. The non-forest habitats, which generally what, that's what people mean by open habitats, it's made up of some very specific habitat types. So we've got, we've, we've numbered them B1, B2, etc. We've got willow scrub, we've got forest roads, the margins, forest roads, the verges and banks, forest roads, wet ditches, streams, ponds, wet peatland, pre-plantation moorland, remnant oak woodland, derelict buildings and walls, cliffs, scree and quarries, managed habitats, which are referred to at the end of the talk, and coal tips as well, which are quite common, obviously, um, in, the, in the valleys of South Wales. So we have a classification system, and this helps us focus on um, working out the distribution of habitats in the forest system, giving the habitats a name, and then working out what condition they're in and how good they are for diversity of species. This is an important point, and an obvious one. Conifer plantations are gated and fenced, so they're designed to be stock proof. And what that means, of course, is that there's a lack of livestock grazing within conifer plantations. Sheep do get in, we all know that, and there is a certain amount of minor grazing taking place. The only real grazing that's taking place, however, is by deer, which includes things like munchak, and uh, by rabbits, which are not that common in the South Coast plantations. Um, and there may be one or two other things that obviously small mammals graze to an extent as well. But really, compared to the habitats outside of the estate, which you'll see in a minute, um, the amount of grazing is minimal. And that has a really big influence on the biodiversity of the, of the estate. And of course, there's very little vehicle traffic. At times, there is a lot of it when the lorries are coming in and out, uh, carrying the timber, etc. And we get certain amount of problems with the scrambling activity and so on and occasional uh, people obviously have to go into the forest for survey work and so on but really the amount of vehicle traffic is minimal compared to what happens outside and this is important too because of pollution and other effects too okay i think this slide really illustrates the effects of grazing and non-grazing this fence is really the dividing line between ronda and taft that side and East for Talbot this site. So this is a, a component of the bulk plantation system here and outside it this is a sheep grazed moorland. This is what the, this would have looked like before the plantation, uh, before the, the trees were planted, before this was fenced off into plantation. And so you can see the difference. Look, look at the heather, what our heather is doing inside the plantation, sheep are excluded here and outside the plantation you can't see any heather at all because the sheep, as soon as it, if there is any, they eat it straight away. Um, so there are really big effects uh, that come from the lack of grazing. So these are B2 and B3 habitats, which are associated with, with roads, the plantation roads. And we have large numbers of flowering plants that grow along these roads. Literally, I mean, if you walk along these roads for 100 metres or so, you can easily notch up 100 species in spring, in summer in particular. Um, so there is a really staggering diversity here sometimes. And I'm not just talking about flowering plants, there are large numbers of bryophytes as well. 
Um, and these verges do benefit from the low grazing pressure really quite a lot. They provide important food plants for um, all sorts of butterflies, species like birds for trefoil and wild strawberry are, are abundant. You can see all the birds for trefoil in this photograph. And orchids, uh, which are, I, I guess, sort of flagship species for many people, are really common uh, in these roads um, for reasons that I explained in a minute. And one of the reasons for this is because there's quite a lot of calcium uh, in, in the roadside verges because many of our roads have been in the past dressed with calcium gravel, calcium containing limestone gravel. And so that's made these verges very base rich. And so we get quite a lot of calcium loving species, both vascular plants and bryophytes as well. And that includes many orchids. So lots of plants benefit from the low grazing pressure. The photograph on the left shows, you know, typical colorful, dis colorful displays like this are pretty typical. Lots of bell heather, which is very common in the estate. This is um, uh, lemon scented fern, Oreopteris uh, libusperma, and this is Polycaria dysenterica, which is uh, a common flea bay. So, all sorts of lovely colourful displays like this in, in the banks and verges. But very significantly, we do have really nice populations of club mosses. Uh, fur club moss um, is really abundant in many places in our, our, our forest verges, particularly where there's heather and stag's horn club moss as well. Stag's horn club moss is an example of a species which has really declined very, very markedly in, in over the last couple of decades or more. And so has fur club club moss to a certain extent. And I can say, I think with a, with a certain degree of accuracy now that fur club moss and stag's horn club, club moss are more common within the forestry estate than they are outside in their natural moorland habitats. Um, the only places outside the estates uh, where, where they are doing reasonably well are on steep north facing cliffs. So forest roads dressed with limestone chippings then will have lots of calcicole species in them. Look at this bank of wild thyme here, which is uh, uh, near Rigos in, in uh, Glencastle Forest. And um, this fabulous population we have of autumn gentian, which occurs along one of our forest roads which is shared between Neath Talbot and John McIntyre. Now, these are really species which are, are missing from much of our landscape, particularly in South Wales. They're not species that you see very often in the uplands of South Wales. Lots of orchids. Um, commonly, the most common, I guess, is Southern Marsh Orchid here, Dactylorhiza pretomissa, but also we have common spotted, spotted orchid is really quite common. Dactylorhiza fuchsiae, and we get the hybrid between these two as well. Quite a lot of that. Pyrimidal, pyrimidal orchid, bee orchid, broadleaf hellebrine, and twig blade. They're all out there and they all occur along forest roads. The banks of forest roads are often very mossy. Sometimes they, they're much more mossy than they are sort of um, containing vascular plants, like I've shown you here. And they can be very interesting too. So you get Again, specific communities of bryophytes that grow here, which include lots of common species. I'm not saying they're rare species, but it's a very, very nice sort of community of, of, of bankside mosses, which it does include interesting species like Wesleyan Brian Brevirostri, which is more common in our banks than, than elsewhere in Glamorgan. I couldn't not include this photograph, uh, not taken obviously in our estate. This is from Balmacara in, in northwestern Scotland. But you know, all plantations elsewhere in Britain are similar. We all have the roads and all of the drainage ditches. We all have the banks. And look at the along all along this road, there were huge clumps of this beautiful golden head moss, Ruteria chrysocoma. This is a, a hyperhoceanic species. And you know, th this is spectacular stuff, in, in my opinion. This is a really important comp component of the roadside flora, the tall herb flora. And again, it obviously benefits from the lack of grazing that we get in, in, in conifer plantations. Species like hemp agrimony, which you've got here, and you can see in the distance there, uh, rose bay willow herb, you can also see it here. And this is wild angelica, you've also got hedge parsley here, uh, and many other species too, there's a ragwort there. These are really important for pollinators, particularly bees, flies and butterflies. They all benefit 
greatly from from these these tall herb floral verges. And you'd be amazed on a, on a nice sunny day if you prepare to sit and wait and look, you find all sorts of things flying at the right time of year. We get small pearl bordered artillery here, lots of brown argus, particularly last year, and dingy skipper too. And then any number of other things. I'm not an entomologist, and all of my insect photographs are really, um, you know, off the cuff. This is Volucella zonaria, a really big um, harbor fly, which is a, a hornet mimic that occurs on a, some uh, devil's bit scabious, which also grows uh, in, in these um, forest verges. Uh, this is Sayara hemorobioides, which is a, a small fly, which is a little bit like a, a small St. Mark's fly, where it's got a yellow sort of underneath its body, underneath it's quite yellow. And then this beautiful thing, which of course is a bee chafer, Trichius fasciatus, and then this lovely bee, Bombus monticula, which is the bilberry bumblebee. Here it's sitting obviously on a composite floor, uh, but it, it, it often occurs in our verges where we have lots of heather and bilberry. Roadside ditches, which is how that before, are also common along the sides of all forest roads. You, you saw one in, in the, the photograph from Scotland a few minutes ago. Um, these are really important habitats for uncommon wetland plants, for common frog, for insects, all sorts of things are, are found in these ditches. And I'll draw your attention to this sort of suite of species, flowering plants that grow in these ditches. In particular, ivy leaf bellflower. Um, Wales and, and, and the southwest of England are probably the headquarters for this really interesting species. And um, um, it's, it's a really Atlantic species. So, you know, we are responsible really for the conservation of things like this. And the fact of the matter is that ivy leaf bellflower is disappearing from places outside of the estate simply because of changes in land use, you know, areas that have been drained and so on and so forth. So the, the populations of ivy leaf bellflower that we have in the estate really must be looked after. Uh, and they're only in the non-forest matrix of the plantation. It often occurs with other, you know, iconic species like bog pimpernel, a really lovely thing, and lesser skullcap, which also isn't really that common. So these are really important indicator species for the B4 habitat. Ponds are, are common, um, and of course they, they have all the common dragonflies. I've just got a photograph of two here, just two species that sat still long enough for me to capture them on the photograph. Um, this is a southern hawker, uh, this is a keel skimmer. But these ponds, ponds are also really important for other things as well. Important populations of common toads and palmate notes as well. They're, they're really important for species like that. And then peatland, um, this is really the subject of another project which is running in parallel to this called the Lost Peatlands Project. Uh, where we try to restore peatlands uh, in the uplands uh, of the Penacamouth area. Um, these peatlands have, you know, their characteristic species as well, like bog asphodel, co common cotton grass, and of course, round, round leaf sundew. And we use these as indicator species for picking out uh, the good areas of, of, of peatland. And the last habitat in, in this section I'm going to talk about is this. The, these are willows um, which commonly grow at the sides of Sitka spruce along forest roads um, and they're really important for bryophyte communities so a close-up of, of willows like this can show sort of epiphytic bryophytes really covering um, the branches and, and the trunks of these trees these are mostly this community is mostly made up of orthotrichum and orthotrichum species and eulotus species and the most common species here is probably orthotrichum called kellum which is really common um, but we do have lots of other really interesting species as well, particularly hyperoceanic bryophytes, very commonly fingered cowwort, Calura calyptrifolia. I'll tell you a bit about that in a moment. And more recently, we, we discovered in our forests uh, colonies of Irish Daltonia, which I'll tell you a lot more about a bit later on. So just concentrating a little bit on fingered cowwort, Calura calyptrifolia. Um, this is a new species in our landscape. Um, if you went back 50 years ago, there wasn't any Kalura that we knew of anywhere uh, in, in um, this part of the world. 
But now this is its distribution mapped on a one kilometer square basis in Neath for Talbot. And although there are sort of outliers here, most of it is concentrated in this area here, which is where all the plantation is. So basically what the Sitka spruce is doing is it's colonizing our plantations. And here you can see it, big colonies of it here growing with uh, this really tiny little word, which is uh, Microlegionia alicina. Fingered cow word, of course, is a living word. OK, so sort of summing what I'm summing up what I'm talking about. If you if you look at a typical scene like this, which is the top of the Avon Valley, uh, which is part of the, um, the Michelston estate, uh, what we can see in the picture is a mosaic of different phases in the forest cycle. We've got clear fell here. This was large until a few years ago. And then we've got clear fell and pre thicket here. And then we've got thicket here. We've got mature in Sitka spruce here. We've got mature Sitka spruce there. We've got deciduous scrub, which is colonizing this bank here. We've got a forest road, which runs up there. And that, of course, has got a roadside verge. Now, at the time this photograph was taken, during that period of uh, early summer, this clear fell here had meadowpipits and stone shots breeding in it. This clear fell and pre thicket here had nightjar and tree pipits breeding in it. This deciduous shrub here had all manner of resident British birds, robin, song thrush, blackbird breeding in it. The thicket had garden warbler in it. Maturity in Sitka spruce here, well, I didn't get into that coop, so I, I'm, not, I'm not sure what is in, in there. The forest road had brown argus, uh, dingy skipper, all the common butterflies were flying there. And the roadside verge, um, you know, had all the, lots of the plants, including um, lesser skullcap and uh, bog pimpernel in, in, in ditches. So, you know, there's the mosaic that we're talking about in the forest landscape. I want to show you this. This is a, an extract from um, one of the papers by Jamie Humphrey and his associates who wrote an awful lot of papers uh, on the biodiversity of, of Scottish and, and uh, Northern English uh, plantations. Um, really excellent pieces of work and just concentrate on the facts and figures which are shown within the, the ellipse here. OK, what we have here is a, a column showing taxa, OK, invertebrates, and fungi, lichens, bryophytes, and so on, birds. And we're comparing, just look at this, this is the relevant bit. Just look at the column for Sitka spruce, upland Sitka spruce, and upland oak forest. Virtually in every category but one, Sitka spruce can match oak forest for diversity of the particular taxon which is being considered. So here we've got uh, Coleoptera, 47 in Sitka spruce, 31 in oak. OK, sub canopy invertebrates, coleoptera again, 52 in Sitka spruce, 62 in oak. Ground invertebrates, let's say uh, coleoptera excluding carabids, 35 in Sitka spruce, 19 in oak. It's only when you get down to lichen that you find that oak is significantly, oak forests are significantly um, better than Sitka spruce and lichens. And I think that is generally probably true as well for Sitka spruce forests. They don't particularly have, Sitka doesn't really have a, uh, well, our Sitkas don't really have a, a, a lot of lichen screening on them. Bryophytes do pretty well. Rascal plants do pretty well as well. There's no data, unfortunately, for the upland uh, oak woodland songbird, but I think the, the figures are more or less would be on a, a par there as well. It's the fungi figure, which is startling. The number of fungi uh, they recorded uh, in Sitka spruce, upland Sitka spruce, 232 species compared to 127 in, in oak forests. So, you know, you can't really say that these places are biological deserts. They're not. I want to summarize now, it's really important to us to actually figure out where the gaps are in our knowledge. So I've written a number of topics here from habitat distribution, habitat condition, et cetera, all the way down to the specific taxonomic groups and try to indicate where I think our gaps are. As far as habitat distribution is concerned, we know a bit, but there's still lots to know. For habitat condition, I think we have large gaps. We really need to look at different habitats, in, particularly in the non-forest component, uh, and figure out its condition and see what we can do about it. As far as biodiversity is concerned, 
bryophytes, again, we have some knowledge. We're lucky in South Wales, we have a really good group of very active bryologists. Um, so we have pretty good knowledge of bryophytes in, in conifer systems, but there are some gaps still. Similarly for vascular plants, there are some gaps still. For fungi, particularly like cancer, there are many gaps. We need to know an awful lot more about these. Birds, pretty good knowledge of birds, but there are some gaps. Large gaps for insects, okay, fairly good for butterfly, perhaps, and um, to a certain extent bees, but for lots of groups who have very large gaps. For other individuals, invertebrates, the gaps are huge. And surprisingly, it's huge gaps as well, or large gaps for reptiles and amphibians. We really need to know more about the distributions of things like Arda and common lizard and, and all those other things. And also for, for mammals, we might know roughly about the whereabouts of things like deer, but we don't really know much about, for instance, the distribution and abundance of small mammals, or voles and things like that, which are a crucial part of the food web uh, of, of these ecosystems. Very quickly, I'm just going to talk, because uh, the talk has gone on quite a long time now, about recombinant ecology. Um, this is really exemplary in conifer forests. Wherever you have bare areas, um, Sitka will, will very quickly rain seeds in and will regenerate in it, alongside our native willows and birch. And those, this gives rise to a recombinant community of alien species and native species. And that's what recombinant ecology is. And this, I think, is an absolutely amazing example of recombinant ecology. This is a maturing pine forest, and it's developing an understory, which is effectively a sessile oak woodland. These are oaks, which are generating underneath it, and there are also rowans here, and holly, and birch, and so on. And you, you have, to, have to ask yourself the question, what is this going to look like in 50 years time? This is a really interesting aspect of recombinant ecology. This, I guess, is one of the most interesting recombinant ecology stories. This is how we think Irish Daltonia colonised Wales and particularly our forests. Irish Daltonia is a hyperoceanic hyper species, which until recent de decades was um, really confined to Southern Ireland and Northwest Scotland, where it enjoyed the, the hyperoceanic hyper, hyper extreme Atlantic conditions, mild, wet, humid, uh, um, sort of ravines and so on. Um, but in recent decades, it has invaded and colonised into Wales. And this is our area here, um, where it, it is now slowly colonising. So how has this come about? Well, the source of, we, our best resident biologist is almost certainly Sam Bozenkett. And Sam has come up with uh, what I think is a very feasible hypothesis for what is happening here. Um, Sam thinks that probably the spores have come from Southern Ireland and what has happened in Southern Ireland, because Sitka forests in Southern Ireland have matured and developed, that the Daltonia has spread effectively within Sitka spruce forests in Southern Ireland because Sitka provides that sort of ameliorated mesoclimate that is mild and sort of free of frost and very, very cold weather. And then this has set up a huge pressure of spores, propagule pressure of spores, which has rained in to our forests on, on frontal systems moving west, okay, across here. So the spores are carried in the frontal systems and they rain in on our forests and our forests provide the sort of mild uh, oceanic, um, hyper-oceanic conditions that um, Daltonia and Kalura like, and so they've been able to colonize. They couldn't do that before the plantation was present because the plantation wasn't there to provide the ameliorated, cool, humid, frost-free conditions. You had moorland with occasional oak trees in it, probably. So establishment was not possible there, no establishment. Establishment only became possible in South Wales when Sitka spruce forest, forest developed. Okay, so yes, we have establishment now. So this is a brilliant example of facilitated colonization. And this can only happen as Sitka spruce plantations develop, as they go forward in time. All right, I won't talk about this, but round leaf wintergreen is also uh, a species which is colonizing our Sitka spruce forests where there are um, uh, willow trees at the edges of the forest. This is the bad side of uh, 
recombinant ecology. Sitka is absolutely amazing at regenerating, as you all know. It produces huge amounts of fertile seed and it's, you know, it produces regen in absolutely no time at all. This is a lovely area of Heathland, which is above Craig Finn and Glamorgan, and it's been saturated by Sitka. And this is a real problem uh, for the conservation and biodiversity of this particular habitat. So quickly, let me let me talk about the biodiversity in the future plantation landscape. This is a, a quotation from Dinning, who was the, the head of the, the, the local forestry operation in the 1970s. He said at that time, and he wrote this in, in a book called Swansea and its Region, which was written when the British Association for the Advancement of Science came to Swansea. He said that forests of the future will be reservoirs of wildlife far more varied than either the tracts of moorland they replaced or the present forests of rather limited age range. Well, it is slightly mischievous to say that, I think. Uh, to say that uh, far more varied than either the tracts of moorland they replaced, I don't think it was fair to say that that way. OK, but that was then and we are where we are now. What he said next, I think, is really true. They, they are reservoirs of wildlife far more varied than the present forest or the forest of that time, which were of rather limited age. That is really important. And that is the key, I think, to the biodiversity in the future plantation landscape. If we look at the distribution of plantation complexes in South Wales on a map like this, you can see that they are sort of distributed like terrestrial islands. And so we can apply uh, theories of island biogeography to them. <clears throat> we can say that biodiversity is a function of any number of things, X1, X2, X3, all the way up to Xn. We don't know what all of those things are, but we know that two of them. We know that spatial uh, gradients are important and temporal gradients are important too. So we can say that uh, species, the number of species biodiversity is a function of area and of time. Well, there's a well-known um, equation which which relates species area uh, to, to diversity, and that's uh, this equation here. It follows what is called the, the, the Arrhenius equation formation, where S is equal to C, A, Z, and A here is area. C is a constant for any particular taxon, and Z is also a constant, which describes really how easy or how difficult it is for a species to reach the island, in this case, the plantation. And what is interesting is here's the, the, the equation plotted as S equals CAZ is going to be hyperbolic like this. And so it starts off quickly. In other words, as we increase area, we get more species, but it eventually it gets plot out. OK, and a little bit of simple maths. I apologize for this. Uh, if we take logs, on either side of this equation, we convert this to a straight line, where Z is now the slope of the line. So we can actually calculate what this mysterious constant is, which gives us some idea of how easy or how difficult that particular ecosystem is to colonize. Well, as far as the area is concerned, that's not really very important for us today in this particular talk, although we could apply it to plantation systems throughout the UK. But time is really important, and this I'm going to make a big point of this. We could do exactly the same thing as apply the Arrhenius equation for time, but now is S equals B is our constant, T is time, Y is our, our uh, exponent there. And now if we take logs either side of that, we can get a value of net Y, which is the slope of the slope. So we can actually write models for these things. But the really important thing I'm trying to think, say here is that conifer plantations are a new feature of our landscape. They're a new feature of South Wales' landscape. They're a new feature of all the landscapes where they occur in Britain. They've developed in a period of decades. They are like terrestrial islands in the landscape. And colonization of these landscapes is a function of space, time, dispersal ability, connectivity, plantation development, and lots of other factors as well. Some we know and some we obviously don't know. But here is a key thing they're not at equilibrium okay we are somewhere on that curve we don't know where we are but we're not at the plateau these ecosystems are still acquiring their flora and fauna and we can expect new colonists in the future via natural or facilitated range expansion i mean for our area i'm hoping that sooner or later we're going to get breeding hen harrier merlin willow tit woodlark and so on we mentioned others as well 
And we may want to assist others, of course, like red squirrel and pine beetle. We need to develop a management forest, management policy for the non-forest habitats. This is crucial. Don't just call them open habitats, recognize them for what they are, and let's have management policies for all of them. Conservation, well, UK forestry standard tells us that the conservation of biodiversity is an essential part of sustainable forest management in the UK. Okay, let's really believe this. The forest operation already creates a sustainable diversity of habitats that were important for species like nature and tree protection. We got there by default. But the biodiversity of the non-forest matrix needs to be recognised. And we need more information about location, about habitat condition, and we need to know about things like where are the ivy leaf bellflowers so that we can protect them? Where are the autumn gentians? Where are the club mosses? Where's the Irish daltonia? Where are the rare lichens? And so on. Lots of non-forest habitats are refuges for species that are disappearing from habitats outside of the estate. Ivy leaf bellflower is a very good example of that. Lots of damage in our forest plantations is collateral. It, it's just accidental and it can be prevented if we know where things are and we flag things up so that machines like this can work around the system. So all operations should be undertaken with biodiversity in mind and we can think about diversifying um, our roadside villages simply by increasing the area. We know area is an important part of the biodiversity equation. Widen the roadside villages if we can. In Neath for Talbot, if we just widen the roadside villages 10 metres either side, we would increase the verge by 10 square kilometres. It's, it's, it's quite incredible. There's huge scope for habitat creation and restoration in all of our forests. Finally, Restoring the pre-plantation landscape. A lot of you I know listening will be very interested in sort of woodland creation and so on within forestry landscapes. And I haven't talked very much about that. But, you know, a lot of this is going on very nicely on its own. This is sessile oak colonizing some large clear fell in Michelson Forest. This photograph was taken last year. Look at all the, the young sessile oak trees on this bank here. Now, a couple of years before, this was all large. The larch was taken down. At first, it looked as if it was just going to rebound back to Heathland. But soon, you know, some jays have been very busy here planting acorns, I guess. And this is now developing in very nicely into Cecil Oak Woodland. So look at the history of this patch of land here. 3000 years BC, it was Wildwood. 1100 AD, it was moorland. In 1960, it was still moorland. And then it was planted with larch. So by 1980, there was lots of larch here. And then in 2015, it was clear fell. And in 2050, is it going to be oak woodland? It could be, will be, if we just leave it alone. It may be recombinant oak woodland. There will be a few larches in there, no doubt. It will come up as well as a result of regen and maybe a lodgepole pine or so. But it will be mostly oak woodland. So that will restore the pre-plantation landscape in a sense. And this is something else which is going on in our area. This is reclaimed marshy grassland in Lyme Delice. And this is a project which has undergone, uh, been, been going on between, in a collaboration between Natural Resources Wales and Butterfly Conservation. This was a, uh, a Sitka coop. It's been clear fell, you can see an old stump there. And now it's been cattle grazed. It has continuity with a number of other marshy grassland areas, which we can't see in this photograph, which have marsh fertilities in it. And so it is forming part of the metapopulation dynamics of the marsh fertility population at the moment. It, it, the area of grazed pasture, which was formerly under Sitka, is much larger than this, but we'll just show you this photograph. So that's another example of how we can reclaim uh, sort of uh, pre-plantation landscape. So finally, these are the key points. Plantations are intensively managed ecosystems and their biodiversity is largely sustainable. They have a forest component and a non-forest component. The forest cycle provides a succession of forest habitats with distinctive animal and plant communities. 
There is an urgent requirement for a conservation strategy that will help to maintain and enhance biodiversity in the non-forest plantation structure. There are many gaps in our understanding of biodiversity in plantations. Plantation ecosystems are young and they're still acquiring their flora and fauna. And what I think is really important and has been particularly important in South Wales in this last horrendous year that we've all been through, our plantations are really quite accessible. Many of our plantations can be accessed within walking distance, you know, unlike sort of the bigger plantations in other parts of, the, of England and Scotland. And they're easily accessible by car and, and so on. They have provided a, an immense resource for people during this difficult time. And they will continue to do this in the future. So their wildlife education potential and their potential for wildlife training for health and well-being in a safe, accessible environment cannot be understated. It is so important that we think of that in the future. OK, I'll finish by just showing you um, the guys who've been involved in this pilot project. Uh, Nicola Brobridge, NRW, Scott Han, by NRW. Myself, I'm the, the chairman of the, uh, the Leaf Patalba Nature Partnership at the moment. Joey Pickard, who's been one of the ground workers. Rose Rivera, who works for MPT. Becky Sharp, MPT, Hannah Shaw, NRW, Mike Shearing, MPT, and uh, one of the ground workers, and Richard Whistler, who was a, a, a ecologist from Rhonda Cunnantaff. We've all, I think we all make up a really active, uh, very, very focused team. Um, I, I, while you rest your eyes on, on this last slide, I just want to say that we, this project comes to an end um, next week, in actual fact. And we're, we're looking for funding to keep the ball rolling. Um, so if you are, we think this is really important. We, we think we've, we've done a good job here and we think we're getting to know our plantations very well. We think we've got a good system for looking at our plantations biodiversity. And we're keen to keep it going. So if any of you are aware of any suitable funding or any organisation that would be interested in supporting the continuation of this project, please get in touch with us via Rose Rivera's um, email, which is on this slide here. OK, so it's rivera at mpt.gov.uk. Thank you very much for listening. Fantastic. Uh, thank you, Charles. We've got a couple of questions come in. Um, Rose has forwarded them on to me. If anyone else has any questions, uh, please do put them in the chat. And if we don't have a chance to get to them today, we'll provide some written answers. Uh, the first one I've got here is, do the birds that are found in mature forest depend on which tree species are in the forest? To a certain extent, yeah, they do. Um, there's no doubt that, um, for instance, among, among for crossbills are a pretty good example. Um, the common crossbill uh, can feed very well from Sitka spruce, um, but although they quite like pine as well, quite unlike sort of uh, pine crossbills and the, uh, the Scottish crossbills, which have larger bills, larger beaks. And so they're very good at prizing um, seed out of pine cones. Um, the common crossbill is not quite so good at doing that, but it's very good at getting seed out of Sitka spruce. So it's, it's very dependent on Sitka spruce. Um, the siskins, um, they they, 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 they're they happy with the Sitka spruce too. Um, they're much happier with sunflower seeds, by the way, that's another story. Um, they, 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 they love larch, uh, unfortunately, and I think they, they have missed out. There has been a slight dip, I think, in the Siskin population since a lot of the larch has, has disappeared. Um, as for the rest of them, you know, the things like ravens and uh, the birds of prey, they, they're fairly happy with good tall trees to give them security and uh, good access positions. Um, yeah, there is a certain, about, a certain amount of specific requirement for certain species, but uh, there is a lot of generality there as well. It's a good question. Great, thank you. Uh, the next one we've got is, do you notice significant, vegeta uh, significant differences in vegetation between areas with higher deer densities and those without? No. Excellent. Thanks. <laughs> there we are. Um, OK. Um, in the Humphrey, Ferris, Jukes and Peace 2003 research, 
how did the sample size of citrus spruce plantation compare with upland oakwoods uh, how many plots were there in each? I don't know if you'll know that off the top of your head. <laughs> That's a stinker, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, I can't. I, I, you'll have to refer to the paper. Um, and it's it's online. It's, you can download it as a PDF. Um, I, I, off the top of my head, no, I, 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 I can't answer that question. I'm sorry. Yeah, no problem. Uh, there is a related question that, that came through here, which is um, for the comparison between oak and spruce uh, in terms of taxa, how much in this comparison uh, were the differences influenced by scale? Um, I don't know if you have any general thoughts on well, that's that. That's the same question, I think, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, again, I, just, just look at the paper. There's a whole series of papers by, by that team. Um, and also similar, slightly similar ones from, from, from the Irish uh, foresters as well. So people might want to look at those things. They, they can all be answered. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we had something come in here, which is, I mean, it's more of a comment than a question, but um, I suppose it's worth mentioning. Um, and the comment is that unless we maintain the forest roads to a significant standard for the purposes of hauling timber, it will be difficult to sustain management of conifers uh, for the purposes of timber production. Um, it, I think it's probably worth commenting at this point that it, it is possible for, to create these habitats and maintain them without getting in the way of forest operations. Um, Absolutely. Uh, I have no doubt in my mind that we can work around that. That, that is not uh, an impossible problem. That, that can be done. OK, excellent. Uh, there are lots of questions coming through. Um, OK, the next one we've got here is, would there be benefit in keeping some spruce as old growth? Oh, whoa, that, if only, um, that would be great. I, I think that would be really good. Um, how long you'd want to leave it for, perhaps forever, I don't know. It, it, you almost say to yourself, yeah, just to see what happens. Um, I don't know how practical that is from a, uh, from a, a forestry business point of view, but you know, it may be possible to leave, to leave some of them go. Um, that, that would be an absolutely fantastic thing. I mean, one of the things I didn't mention, um, in my talk uh, is that the, the rate of growth, once it gets, starts going, it, it really goes. It, it, its rate of growth and its volume production is phenomenal. It's much bigger than all the other trees grown in the forest. Um, and, you know, quite a lot of, of, of natural thinning goes on as well. So lots of trees fall down and you get rotten wood at all sorts of stages and all sorts of invertebrates and fungi associated with them. So the older the forest gets, the more diversity of that sort you get as well. And, you know, what would be interesting is it would be interesting to see what sort of vascular plant flora could develop, but you really what happens to the bright, those luxuriant bryophyte floras as well? It's really interesting questions. And, you know, I showed pine forests, which were being colonised by oak and rowan and birch. Some Sitka forests um, in some places also have uh, things like um, sessile oak and and species like that coming up inside them as well. So maybe in the fullness of time, they would develop an undergrowth of um, Cecil oak woodland type in them. And maybe, you know, in those pine forests and in those Sitka, hypothetical Sitka forests, eventually the, the oak would win out and what we'd end up with would be Cecil oak forests. So be it. But it's an interesting experiment, isn't it? I, I think so anyway, to let it just go. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the next one we've got here is, does continuous cover forest management have wildlife benefits compared with the extreme clear fell system? Whoa. <laughs> uh, well, does anybody know the answer to that question? I, I think there are been, it's, I think there are gains and losses there. Um, it's funny, Han, Hannah Shaw and I have had this discussion a, a few times about this and you know, I think continuous cover is, is, is going to be introduced more and more into our systems. Um, and I, I don't think I've seen enough of it yet to be, be really to answer that question from my point of view. I, I could see that for birds in particular, some, some species would benefit greatly. What worries me is what might happen to birds like nightjar and perhaps tree pipit as well. Um, nightjar clearly benefit greatly from a clear fell pre-thicket phase such as we have now. 
Now, it may be that because our landscape is now more or less saturated with nightjars in summer, that they would quickly adapt to a, a continuous cover system as well. But I don't know. I think if we changed over from you know, clear felt to continuous cover now, straight away, there could be consequences. And I think we need to do it, if we can, gently to see what happens. There, there, there will obviously be benefits, I think, but there will be losses too, I believe. OK, uh, I don't have any more questions coming in at the minute. Lots of uh, comments of thanks and congratulations on your talk, Charles. Oh, um, you. There was one question uh, about whether we can provide a link to the paper. I think that's probably something we can circulate afterwards with. Yeah, that's not questions we're not able to answer now. Yeah. Um, yeah, so if anyone has any further questions, uh, please keep adding them in and we will get to them now. Uh, I've had one comment come through now which says uh, we are keeping Sitka as old growth or long term retention and deadwood under clear fell and, uh, and continuous cover silvicultural systems. Uh, we can have recombinant Olympic Peninsula here. Fair enough. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> bring it on, I say. Oh, I could see uh, in the down the bottom, uh, Claire Dinham has got her hand up and wants to ask a question. If you want to unmute and ask Claire, go ahead. Great, thanks, Joey. Um, I can't seem to see the chat button, so sorry about that. Probably just me being a bit uh, bit dopey. But anyway, um, hi Charles. Um, great talk and really interesting to to hear about the diversity and nice to see invertebrates feature in there as well. Um, I was quite keen to uh, take a look at how, uh, sorry, the the extent of the of the um, the woodland estate, the Welsh government woodland estate, and how that intersects with the the bee lines network across Wales. Do you know how I could get hold of the GIS layer for the woodland estate, or is there such a thing? Almost so certainly there will be. I mean, I would contact Hannah Shaw. Okay, great. Do you know Hannah? Yeah, I know Hannah. Yeah, uh, yeah. I'm sure Hannah can get you, um, you know, a, a route to finding that that out. Yeah. OK, and just to say that um, you mentioned about the, the partnership that you've got going on as well. So uh, we're you know, really keen to to promote beelines and look at a range of habitats, maybe broaden the range of some of the, ha the habitats. And woodland is probably one of them that you know didn't really feature as a as a priority habitat within the beelines mapping, but obviously is is beneficial. It's something I'd like to uh, look into a bit more. So uh, in terms of you know future being involved or, or projects then you know potentially uh, interest from from bug life okay yeah good good thank you thanks claire uh got a couple of comments come in here charles uh one of which says is a report on the way and where are you publishing um not well not a full scale report i know there is a report um, Joey, you might be better to answer that question, actually. Yeah, um, I, it's a very short scale project at the moment, so I, I expect we would want to, to extend it and do some more more work before we kind of present our full findings. But we we do have some, you know, really significant species records that we found during the project and those are going to be uh, kind of disseminated through local recording centres. Um, I just add that there will be um, Sometime this year, I think, uh, an article in British Wildlife which uh, which covers many of the things that I've talked about. So people might want to uh, get access to that as well. Um, a lot of the stuff that one of the, the jobs that we've done here, um, Mike and Joey have been trying to collate all of the database stuff um, which relates to records of any number of things in the forest. So there's a lot of data out there. And uh, we're in the in the process of collating it all together so we get a, a good composite picture. But we, you know, it's, it's 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 a part of the gap analysis really. It's finding out where our, the gaps in our knowledge are. And as I said in that slide, which which outlined that we we know certain things pretty well, like vascular plants, 
bryophytes, birds and so on, some insects, but largely there are huge gaps in our knowledge and the continuation of this project will help us to understand um, and you know, get that right, to, to put a right to that. Yeah, this project was also uh, designed with uh, the aim of kind of connecting recorders with uh, people who work in the Woodland Estate, so information is going to be shared through local nature partnerships as well as a, a really important network. Uh, I can see someone down the bottom has got their hand up, but I can't see who it is, but please feel free to uh, unmute yourself and ask your question. Hi, sorry, yeah, it's me. I haven't got a chat function either on mine. So um, yeah, Charles, um, I assume the forestry isn't actually around a water, um, a reservoir or anything, because you haven't mentioned about water quality and conifers and things like that, have you? Yeah. No, but there, there are reservoirs within, um, in fact, there's two, there's two really important lakes, one very, very important lake um, in the Glyn Castle estate, and that's Llynvach, which is an oligotrophic lake, um, and it is surrounded by Sitka, and that Sitka probably is having an impact on the water quality. Having said that, the, the stuff that's in Llynvach now, uh, and there are a lot of key plants there like water lobelia, quillworts, um, and um, sparganium, uh, well, angustifolium, I can't remember the English name of that at the moment. And they, these are typical species of oligotrophic lakes and we know that they're there still as they were before the plantations were put there. So the city doesn't seem to be having a huge effect on them. Um, I don't think the effects of Sitka are so acute as they were, let's say, I don't know, in the 1950s when aerial pollution was being reined in because you know, you know what happened, the Sitka spruce caught um, sulphur dioxide particles and so on, and that was reined into to reservoirs and lakes and had that catastrophic effect on cardis flies and all the other invertebrates, which again had a knock on effect on dipper population. I mean, there's there's a, a whole ream of uh, papers on, on that, but I don't think that is quite so bad these days because we don't have the area, aerial pollution that we had in those days. But there must be an effect, I think, because yeah. of the way in which Sitka acidifies uh, its yeah. environment anyway. Um, yeah, that's um, maybe, that would, maybe that wouldn't be shown too greatly in, in Klinbach because it's an acidic lake anyway. Um, I, don't know. I can see Len Powell sitting in the audience. I don't know if Len has any comments on that. What do you think, Len? Unmute, Len. You're muted, Len. <laughs> I think he's unmuted, but um, we can't hear him for some reason. Sorry, Len. Well, Len would be a perfect guy to, to answer your no, question. No, it's just interesting because I'm doing a study around the forest at the moment. On Dartmoor, um, yeah, and it's very much looking about whether the forestry is right for that area, really, and to, yeah. and it's very uh, an acidic catchment, and lots of dissolved organic carbon in the water is being picked up from clear fell, um, clear fell management. So yeah, it's just interesting. What's just your feeling on it? Oh, I, I don't think our conifers are, don't look quite so biodiverse as yours. Um, there's lots of grazing that gets in from, you know, probably not fenced properly and things like that. But no, really interesting talk there and really, yeah, makes me want to go and look at all the briar fights. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah. I, I don't know. The thing is, Deborah, is sometimes it's a matter of going out there and concentrating. There's nothing like sitting and looking. Yeah, um, no, definitely. For a while before you, 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 you really catch on. Um, yeah, thank you. No, yeah. That's great. OK, we've only got uh, a couple of minutes left, so we'll do one more question. Uh, I think next on the list is Chris Yarrow and then anyone else. If you could add your questions in the chat or email them through to Rose um, through the email address provided and we'll provide you a written answer to that. Uh, so, Chris, if you want to unmute and ask your question, uh, go for it. Oh. I know what you need a little bit of that one. Oh, yeah. Yes, hello. Um, a very interesting talk. Um, pause restoration is a very topical subject. 
can you, if you were to have uh, spruce on a, an ancient woodland site, would you suggest there are any arguments for the retention of the Sitka spruce or are the arguments for forest restoration outweighing those retention arguments? Um, I'm sort of tempted to do, deflect that question to, to Hannah Shaw. Hannah may want to come in on this, but what I'm going to say is, yes, I think I would for, for pause restoration. I think I would remove the Sitka um, because you'd want to get back to as good a replica of the original ancient woodland system as possible. And um, I think you would need to remove the, the Sitka. I, I, is, I don't know, is Hannah out there? Hannah, can you comment on that? Are you able to comment? We can ask Hannah to provide a written answer to that, Charles, and uh, and circulate that round. Yeah, I, 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 just to get back to Chris there. Um, Hannah, uh, this is an area that, where Hannah Shaw works, Chris, and so she's She's involved in in pause restoration. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, she is. She's back. Yeah, yeah. Go on, go, Hannah. Oh, sorry, it's just my internet is really bad. But um, yeah, what you said, Charles, was um, was correct. Um, yeah, it's policy driven, so we do have to restore all ports back to their native um, yeah NBC woodland NBC. But if there is a particular tree covered in lichens and things, well, I'm sure we could perhaps um, argue that they only mark them and they die um, and leave it or the back feature. OK, good. good. Well, yeah, thank you for that question. I uh, the answer, I'm just worried that uh, the uh, policy may be driving the science rather than the other way around. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that that could be a problem in some some circumstances, and I think we have to be very careful about that. Um, but I mean, we the the, the project that, that we are have undertaken and want to continue will not be driven in that sort of way. Um, we will take a, a, a very impartial view and a view which is aiming towards increasing biodiversity in the Welsh woodland estate, irrespective if we think that the, the forest policy at the time is not working for that, then we will say it is not working. And, um, you know, if, if we can only say these things, obviously, we don't drive the policy, we're there to make recommendations. But yeah, you, you're quite right, Chris. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. Uh, I think we're going to call it an end there, Charles. We've just uh, just crossed the line past 12.30. Um, so we'll we'll provide written answers to any questions which we haven't had a chance to get to. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, for coming. Uh, if you want to unmute and say thanks to Charles for a nice presentation, well delivered and very informative. Uh, now is your chance. And uh, thank you. 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 Um, Welsh Government Woodland Estate mapping is available on Slay, just if anyone's still still around. <laughs> that might help. Thanks, Andy. Thank yep. you.